Good morning, Chapel. And it's good to see you here in person. Obviously, following Easter Sunday, but also online. We have many, many people watching us online. So, if you would just real quick give everybody online a big round of applause to welcome them in. Uh, it was good seeing some 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 faces that we haven't seen in a while with Dave and Eva Stone. Her here have been here for years. Great friends of ours have been uh, watched online for a long time, and now we're in person. So it's always good. And we start a new series today called "Hearing the Voice of God." Uh, the reason for that, we're going into prophetic presbytery in May, on May 16th and 17th, which we did two years ago, which to me is one of the game-changing, life-changing moments in our church's history. We're going to do that again, May 16th and 17th. So we're going to unpack uh, what the voice of God means, what the word prophecy means. And we also have a prophetic workshop on May 15th from 9 a.m. to noon to help you uh, dig deeper into the gift of prophecy and what that may mean for you and your family. So as we get ready for that, we're going to walk through hearing the voice of God. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn to John. John chapter 10, John chapter 10, and if you have your phone, you have the Church Center app, our sermon notes are actually in that uh, Church Center app as well, and on the Version Bible app. I don't know if you know this or not, but you're at war whether you realize it or not. Like years ago in World War II, like America took this stance of trying to become neutral. Like they just wanted to stay neutral in the entire world war because they didn't want to get involved in it. And so for a couple of years, they just tried to stay out of the fight. Even though there was war raging in Europe and in Asia, they just tried to stay out of it. And then all of a sudden, Pearl Harbor happened. So even though we were trying to maintain a, a position of neutrality, we were still at war whether we realized it or not. We were being attacked and having a plan of attack against us even though we were trying to become neutral. The same is true for you. Even if you think you're not at war, even if you think you're neutral, there is a war going on right now for your attention. For your attention. There's literally business models created to steal your attention. It's called attention merchants, where most business models try to sell you a a product. Attention merchants try to resell eyeballs. They are literally spending money to steal your attention because they have a phrase that where your attention is, there you are as well. So, I mean, if they steal your attention, even if you're not at the store, if they steal your attention with an ad on Facebook and it draws your attention, now you're at their store. If they can't be where you want you to be, they'll draw your attention that way, and they try to steal your attention by being the loudest voice in your life, being the most repetitive voice in your life. By echoing the things you want, they they try to steal your attention. And so the world is trying to steal your attention because they know who you focus on and what you focus on will determine who you will be. Also, the world fights through words. We don't fight wars as much anymore through guns and planes and tanks. Now wars are fought through words. Diplomacy, attacking through verbal debate, attacking. We see this in our political climate. Now each side is fighting each other through words. And we know this way back in elementary school. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will what? Never hurt me. And we all know that is a lie. RJ, the other day we were riding back from school and he plays basketball all the time. We want to play football because he's falling in love with lifting weights. So he takes his shirt off. 99% of the time, he's around anybody. Showing off his little bitty baby chest. Talks about his two or three chest hairs that are non-existent. He just walks around showing off his chest. And he's been working out. And I said, if you like working out so much, you probably should play football. So we didn't push him because, you know, you'll get stronger, faster, you'll enjoy it. And uh, he said, well, I don't really want to play. And so the day after school, I said, hey, I think I know why you don't want to play football. He said, why? I said, I don't think you're scared of getting hurt. I think you're afraid that you won't get to play, and you'll get embarrassed. He said, hmm, you ain't lying. (laughs) And I said, well, buddy, it's not that big of a deal if you don't get to play. Like, like you'll still learn discipline and hard work and teamwork. You'll get stronger. You'll get faster. You'll you'll enjoy the, the team concept. He said, dad, you don't understand how mean kids are at my school. I said, buddy, but it's not big of a deal. It's just kids. It's just words. He said, no, you don't understand how mean they are, how much they joke on you and embarrass you and and make fun of you if you don't get to play. Like, if you don't get to play football or basketball, they'll make fun of you. I said, buddy, it's not that big of a deal. He said, dad, you don't understand. I know. I'm the meanest one of them all. (laughs) He said, I don't want that karma to come back on me where I made fun of everybody else. Now they make fun of me. Like, literally, the world fights with words. Like, we build ourselves up by tearing other people down. The enemy 
builds himself up by tearing us down. That's why the voice of God is so important. One word from the Lord can rebuild a generation of being torn down by the words of families, of friends, of ex-spouses, of the enemy. One word from the Lord can change your entire life. That's why it's so important for us to, one, know that God speaks, and two, begin to listen to what he says in our lives. So if you would stand to your feet as we read John chapter 10, verses 1 through 6 together. This is Jesus speaking, if you have a regular Bible, not a phone Bible, the words are in bread. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him, the gatekeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice. Somebody say, hear his voice. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep. By name. You know why? You have a name on earth and you have a name in heaven. You have a name everyone else identifies you by, but you have a name that God has placed within your spirit and your soul that he knows you by. The world may call you Jacob, but he calls you Israel. He calls you by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all of his own, he goes before them and the sheep follow him and they know his Voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. Father, we thank you for the written word, and we thank you for the spiritual word and the Spirit's voice in our lives. And right now, in these few moments, Father, I want to rebuke every wrong thought about your voice every wrong thought about the prophetic. And Father, I ask that you allow your spirit's voice to be the loudest voice in our lives. Open up our hearts, our minds, and our spirits to receive what you have for us today in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. You may be seated. So this whole chapter and kind of chapter nine is, is literally Jesus revealing himself as the good shepherd. So he's saying, I'm the good shepherd. And he's contrasting that to the bad shepherds that were over the Jews in the Old Testament and even there with the religious people in the New Testament. And he's trying to reveal himself as this good, true, one shepherd for us. But to understand what a shepherd is, you have to realize that we are sheep. In the past year, I've heard a million different people when it came to masks or anything else, well, I'm, I'm not a sheep. Yes, you are. Doesn't matter if you wear a mask or not. Doesn't matter what political party you follow. If you follow Jesus, you are a sheep. And it's vital for you to come to that understanding because here's a few things that sheep are. Sheep are defenseless. They don't fight on their own. The shepherd fights for them. And so if you don't realize you're a sheep, you'll try to fight battles that you're not prepared to fight. You need a shepherd to fight your battles. Sheep are not meant to carry burdens. Actually, the shepherd will carry the sheep when the sheep can't walk. Sheep tend to settle for less. They'll stay in one pasture even though there's no grass left. They'll stay while the shepherd's trying to take them to better pasture. Sheep cannot care for themselves when they're wounded. They need a shepherd to bind up their wounds. Sheep cannot get up on their own if they fall down. Literally, the the Greek word is cast down. So there's words in Greek that's cast down literally where sheep fall on their back and their legs start flailing upwards. It's almost like a turtle. They can't get back up. So many times we think if we fall down, we can pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps, and you cannot. You are a sheep. You need a shepherd to pick you up and set you right again. And sheep have no sense of direction. They literally follow the voice of their shepherd. So until you're a sheep, until you understand you're a sheep, you'll never seek the voice of God to lead you where you're supposed to be. If you keep buying into this worldly mentality that, that I'm not a sheep, I can do what, then you'll keep on going the wrong direction because a sheep literally needs the voice of the shepherd to find their way because here is the principle. We are all led by the voices we listen to. Your life will be a byproduct of the voices you listen to in your life. 
No matter what that voice is or who that voice is, no matter if it's a parent's voice that you're still seeking their approval from, you're just wanting them to say, I'm proud of you, but it's always failure and failure and correction and correction. And that voice from 30 years ago is still controlling your life now. Or somebody who broke up with you or divorced you said you'll never be lovable is still controlling your life now. See, we're a byproduct of the loudest voice in our lives. And your future will be determined by the voices you listen to today. So you can either listen to the voice of love or you can follow the voice of fear in your life. You can either follow the voice of, of peace, which is the shepherd's voice, or the peace of anxiety, which is the world's voice. You can follow the voice of holiness or the voice of the flesh, or you can follow the voice of heaven or the voices of the world. But whichever voice you follow will determine your destiny. Because God has a plan for your life, and so does the enemy. And he's going to use voices of celebrities. He's going to use voices from social media. He's going to use voices on the TV. He's going to use voices in your head. He's going to use voices from family and friends. He's going to use voices to get you off path, to get you into the wrong pasture, and to prevent you from seeing what God has in store for you. And Jesus says he is the shepherd. He is the voice. He is the voice we need. And he also says... There's some thieves and robbers out there looking to break into where you're at. And so he said there's a gatekeeper. And so we all need boundaries and gates to prevent us from being influenced by the wrong voices in our minds, our hearts, and our spirits. Like we all need boundaries and gates. You need things that prevent the wrong voices in. You need things that prevent people from getting into your mind and into your heart. Bitterness is all about somebody getting into your heart. You need walls built up to prevent people from getting in. And so to understand this, this concept that Jesus is talking about with sheep, what he's referring to is every little village in Judea had a sheepfold. And what that sheepfold was is a place where families or traveling shepherds could store their sheep for the night. So there was multiple flocks of sheep inside the sheepfold. And so how they would take care of them, the sheepfold would have walls that were 8 to 10 feet high with shrubs or thorns on top of it. So that was the boundary to prevent these, these thieves and robbers and strangers from getting into the sheepfold. But there's also a gate that gave people access in and gave the sheep access out. And if the town was big enough, they'd pay one person, a gatekeeper, to guard that gate for all the different flocks. If there wasn't a gatekeeper, the shepherd himself would lay down at the gate and literally sleep across the threshold to prevent anybody who shouldn't get in from getting in. And what he's saying is that for us, as his sheep, you need to have some boundaries because there's people looking to get into your mind to mess you up. There's people looking to get into your heart to break your heart and to break your love. There's people looking to get into your spirit to get you bitter and offended, to get you off the right path that God has in store for you. And he says these three things as thieves. Thieves are people that want to steal something from you, but they use a scheme. It's like the con man. And they try to con you out of your purpose, your destiny, your, your hope, your joy. They try, they try to scheme you out of it. So the enemy will send thieves along your path with voices that try to convince you to give up something God gave you. They'll try to get you to give up the promise that God placed within your heart. They'll try to get you to give up something because they'll scheme you or connive you out of it. But robbers, on the other hand, they're still thieves, but they don't scheme you, they assault you. So they find you outside the sheepfold and they attack you and they ambush you to take from you your joy, your hope, your reputation. They literally grab hold of you and shake out of you everything that God has given you. But he also said they're strangers. And strangers are people that maybe they look familiar, maybe they don't. Maybe they know you, maybe they don't know you that well, but they begin to convince you to let them in on the inside so then they can take from you the true things God has given you. So strangers befriend you and you begin to trust them even though you don't really know them. And in doing so, they convince you to give up the true love of God through fake love and false promises. And they get on the inside of your mind, your heart, your spirit. If you're dating, this is key. The enemy will send strangers, people you don't really know. It takes a couple of years to really get to know somebody. 
And if you meet somebody on the first week or two, you think, oh, I'm in love. He's everything I ever dreamed of. The cat just got out of prison a week ago. He's a beautiful, beautiful soul. No, he is. I saw his Facebook page. He is a slime ball. But you're, oh, he's a stranger. And you've already given him access to your heart. So now he can manipulate and maneuver you to get you outside of God's sheepfold or get you outside the pasture God has brought you into and get you into a place God never intended you to be. He'll try to get access to your heart. He'll try to get access to your mind. So many people get off track with God due to bad relationships. They let their voice become the loudest voice in their mind. They can no longer hear the Holy Spirit's voice. And now this person is leading them, not from victory to victory, but from defeat to defeat and abuse to abuse. Why do so many people go through the pattern of abuse? Because they let a stranger who does not care about their soul, care about their heart, or care about their life. All the stranger cares about is fleecing the sheep. And when you open yourself up, to strangers. You know, we had told our kids when they were young, stranger danger. If they're a stranger, don't talk to them. Even at church, if they're a stranger, don't talk to them. Why? The enemy will place people in your kid's life to steal their innocence and purity. If you think he'll do that with kids, he will do it with you as well. I promise you. And Jesus says, there's a gatekeeper. And so if you want to hear the voice of God correctly, you need to build some boundaries in your life to prevent the wrong things from getting into your spirit. Meaning there may be some movies you should not watch. Meaning there should be some things you do not listen to. Meaning there should be some people you never give access to what you truly feel on the inside of you. But you also need a gate. See, a wall prevents anything from getting in, but a gate allows access in and access out. A gate can be open to let people in. It can be closed to prevent people from getting in. And Jesus says, I'm the gatekeeper. So if you look at boundaries, that's the word of God. You need boundaries of the word of God that you know. There's certain people, I don't have to ask God if I should befriend them. I could be nice to them, but the word of God has already told me, these type of people you probably shouldn't connect yourself with. Do not be unequally yoked with a non-believer. Like, I don't have to ask God, hey, this person is really being nice to me and wants to be my friend. Nope. People that lie, people that deceive, I don't have to ask God. I have boundaries in my life. But I also need a gate. Because what happens is if you don't have a gate and you just have all walls, yes, you may prevent the wrong people from getting in, but you also prevent the Holy Spirit's voice from getting in. So you need a gate in which you can give access to God to speak life into you, but also if anything's on the inside, you can get it out. We call that confession. Like if I confess my sins, there's freedom. If I confess my sins, there's hope. If I confess my sins, there's peace. I have to have something in my life that lets stuff out, but also lets the right stuff in. And that is a gate. Jesus says you need gates and boundaries to prevent those things from happening. But the thing I've learned in the Bible belt, when it comes to the voice of God, many believers will build a gate up that not only prevents people from getting in, it prevents the Holy Spirit's voice from getting in. And you'll be at a gate, it may be a gate of religion where you are told the Holy Spirit doesn't speak today. That once the Bible was finished, he no longer speaks. So now you have this gate that even if God is trying to get something into you, you can't receive it because you've already told God he's not real. Or a gate of offense where you're so offended at something God did not do that you set up this wall instead of a gate and now God's trying to set you free but you won't give him access to your heart to do so. Some of you set up a gate of your heart where God can't get a voice in because of intentional sin. You set up this barrier between you and him where you enjoy sin more than you enjoy his presence and now you're blocking his presence and his voice from accessing your heart. And the voice of the Lord is what sets us free. The voice of the Lord is what brings peace in troubled times. The word and the voice of the Lord is what brings power and strength and joy in my times of desperation. And if I don't let him in, I'll never receive the blessing he has. Because here's the, here's the fact. No matter what somebody told you, no matter if it was your mama, your daddy, your grandmama, your grandpapa, Deacon Smith, Deacon Jones, pastor so-and-so, no matter what they told you, God speaks 
as much, if not more, today than he did in the Bible. God speaks as much, if not more, today than he did in the Bible. Because it is his nature to speak. It is his nature to speak. He is a living God. And living things speak. He's personal. He's a personal God. People speak. That's how we communicate with one another is through our voice. But he's also a relational God. And you build relationships through communication. And so it's his nature to speak. He's always spoken and he always will. He's spoken in the Old Testament. Creation. God spoke and said, let there be light. And there was light. He spoke to Adam and Eve walking around in the garden. He spoke to Noah to tell him to prepare to build a ship to survive the flood. And not just tell him to build it, but how to build it. He spoke to Jacob. He spoke to Abraham. He spoke to Daniel. And even with Daniel, he said he heard the sound of the words of the Lord. He spoke to Jeremiah. He spoke to Jonah why he was rebellious. He was running from God and God still spoke to him. Then you get to the New Testament. He spoke to Mary to tell her she was going to conceive a baby Jesus. He spoke to John the Baptist. He spoke to Ananias in, in the New Testament, in the book of Acts. But he also spoke to Cornelius, who was a Gentile, wasn't even a Jew, and wasn't an apostle. He was just a layperson believer. So the question would be, if God is a person, if God is living, if God is relational, and God spoke before creation, then God spoke in creation, then God spoke in the Old Testament, then he spoke in the New Testament, why all of a sudden would God say, I'm not going to speak to my people anymore? Why would God stop and say, I love communicating with my people in the Old Testament? Man, I love communicating with the New Testament church, but now I'm good. I'm going to stop speaking now. Especially when you look in light of, in the Old Testament, there was a veil between the presence of God and his people. Yet he still spoke. In the New Testament, he removes the veil. Now the Holy Spirit does not reside in heaven nor in a temple. He resides within us. So why would the Holy Spirit stop talking now? And most people would answer the question with this. Well, I've never heard the Lord speak. Well, I've never heard the Lord speak. So since you haven't heard God speak, you don't think he speaks to anybody else? And when did we start letting our experience determine what we believe about God instead of letting God determine what we believe about our experience? And so what happens is we build theologies around our experience instead of around Jesus. So Jesus is a person, Jesus is living, and Jesus speaks. But instead of building a doctrine around his presence and his voice, we start saying, well, well now that the Bible is here, God just doesn't speak anymore, which is a theology called cessationism. Which means once the Bible was compiled of all these different books and conversations God had with his people, once they decided which books would be in the Bible and be our authoritative word, once it was finalized in 300 AD, we said, okay, now, now God's good. He didn't need to talk to us anymore. He didn't need a personal relationship because now we have a book. And they get that off this scripture in 1 Corinthians 13.8. It says, love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. And so we'll take that scripture, which means it has nothing to do with the voice of God. And we'll say, God no longer speaks because now we have the Bible. If you'll throw up that, that timeline of Revelation on the screen. So if the whole purpose of Jesus coming to earth and dying and being resurrected, the whole purpose was so that we could be clean enough and sinless that the Holy Spirit could live within us. In John 17, it says, it's to your advantage that I go away. Why is it to our advantage? So the Holy Spirit could come and dwell inside of us. He could teach us. He could guide us. He could comfort us. He could counsel us all at the same time. Jesus on earth was limited to being one place at one time, one voice. Now the Holy Spirit can talk to every single person on earth at the same time. So the question would be this. If God spoke in the Old Testament, if God spoke in the New Testament, why would God want to exchange the voice of the Lord for a Bible in the modern church? Why would, why would our relationship with God decrease instead of increase? Why would our, our intimacy with God 
decrease instead of increase because what is actually happening is as the timeline of history moves forward, the revelation of God increases within us and within the church. It doesn't decrease. But we do this and what happens is once you buy into this mentality, and and there's some great churches that buy into this theology, but once you buy into this theology, you begin to worship the Bible instead of Jesus. And when you start worshiping the Bible, then your relationship with Jesus comes on a a knowledge, intellectual approach instead of a spiritual approach. And Jesus is not a book. Jesus is a spirit. And Jesus is not dead. Jesus is alive. And he did not die so I could have a Bible. He died so I could have a relationship with him. He did not die so that I could study old history letters in a book. He died so that I could have a relationship with the living God. He died so we could commune with our creator and he could speak directly from heaven into our spirits. And you can tell the two types of people apart. Like, I love the Bible. I, I'm a Bible guy. Like, my Bible is marked up in every single which way. I read my Bible every single day, and I read this, and I believe this. From the beginning where it says <laughs> marriages, the Holy Bible, births and adoptions, and deaths. I don't know why we put deaths in a, in a Bible. All the way to the maps in the back. I believe this word is authoritative. I let it lead the principles of my life. But I do not worship this Bible. I worship Jesus. And I let this Bible point me to to Jesus and create boundaries so I can hear the voice of God clearly for myself. Until you get to that point, you're always going to be needing something more from God. And what you're needing is to hear the voice of the Lord. Because we are led by the voices of God. We listen to. And we are all sheep. And Jesus said, my voice they will follow. I will call them by name. They will hear my voice and I will lead them. You can't be led without a voice in your life. And I am not your voice. Other pastors are not your voice. Your grandparents are not your voice. The Lord's voice is the voice you need to be following. My job as a pastor is not to be the voice for you. It's to help you understand and discern the voice of the Lord so you can go from victory to victory, from pasture to pasture, to grace upon grace. And I promise you, everyone in this room has heard God speak. God is speaking to you. And Job, it says he speaks in mysterious ways. We'll unpack that next week. But he is speaking to you. You may not recognize his voice, You may not discern his voice, but he's speaking to you. And this is why, one, we are created and we are saved to hear the voice of the Lord. Like Jesus created you, just like Adam and Eve, in the garden to what? Walk in the midst of the garden with the Lord. Like everything Jesus did on the cross was trying to bring us back to this Garden of Eden connection and relationship with with God. You were literally created to have conversations with God. You were created to be able to speak person to person to God. Even Moses spoke to God face to face as if he was a friend. God created you. And then through sin, we created this separation between us and him. Like sin almost covers our ears like we're we're little kids. We don't want to hear our parents correcting us. We just cover our ears. Nah, 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 nah. Nah, 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 nah. And you start trying to drown out the voice because your sin, the guilt, the shame, the frustration, the condemnation, then Jesus saves you through the blood to cleanse you, to take away the guilt and shame so now that you can hear the Lord's voice. See, we we hear the Lord's voice because of who we are and whose we are. Like We hear the Lord's voice because we are his children. What kind of God, what kind of father would he be If he was our dad, but he just refused to talk to us. We hear him because of who we are and whose we are. It's not based off our ability. One of the things that went on in this church years ago was the prophetic was so highlighted that we made the prophetic out to be the supernatural, special revelation, special knowledge of a few believers. When in reality, we call prophetic is nothing more than entry-level Christianity. Every single believer Every single Christian 
can hear the voice of God. That is the purpose of the cross. But two, even non-believers can hear the voice of God. You get saved by what? Hearing the gospel and the Holy Spirit drawing you or convicting you and drawing you to the cross through his voice. Like he speaks to everybody. Paul on Damascus Road, God spoke to him while he was killing Christians. He was not saved, but yet God still spoke to him. God spoke to kings that were evil in the Old Testament. God is a God who speaks, and he's speaking to you. But just because he's speaking to you doesn't mean you can't learn to hear his voice more clearly. So he speaks but you can learn to hear his voice more clearly. I mean, you can grow in your ability to discern what he's actually saying to you. You can learn the times he speaks to you the most. You can learn to tune in to what God is actually saying. You can learn to position yourself to hear God more clearly or loudly. One person said, if you can't hear God, if you can't hear his voice, then move closer. One person said way back in the day when before they had refrigerators so your kids couldn't leave the refrigerator door open, that's a good thing, they had these big ice boxes. And these ice boxes had sawdust on the floor. It was like an old shed. And a guy lost his watch inside this ice box. And they couldn't find it. There was no light in the ice box. And so they kept trying to find it, couldn't find it. Finally, this young boy comes in. He just lays down. Just lays on this sawdust in this ice box. Within a matter of seconds, he comes back out with a watch. I said, how'd you do that? We looked all over the floor. You walk in, you lay down, and you find it. He said, I just got to it. It was so quiet, all I could hear was the ticking of the second hand. So you can learn to hear God's voice. Like, my dad growing up, I've, I've joked, my dad was such a smoker. Like, every room in our house had an ashtray. And an ashtray had Marlboro Miles clipped out on it, had a pack of J-O-B 1.5s, which is papers you roll marijuana up with, and a bag of marijuana. And so my whole house, everything was smoking, everything was that. So my dad had this deep smoker's cough. Like no matter where we went, I could be lost in a sea of people. I could be on the other side of the ballpark and looking for my dad. I couldn't say dad because there were so many dads around, but if I heard, <coughs> I knew where my dad was. I had learned, even though my dad wasn't speaking clearly, I knew how to identify his voice. And you can learn to hear God's voice. You can mature in your ability to hear God's voice. I mean, there's a lot of people that can hear God, but they don't discern God because they've not matured in their relationship with him. Meaning maturity to me is the time it takes for you to hear God's voice and the time it takes for you to obey God's voice. That gap that's there, the shorter that gap is, the more mature you are. So if God speaks and you act immediately, that's maturity. If God speaks and you wait a month, two months, two years, ten years, that is immaturity. And so as you mature, I believe as you mature in hearing God's voice, God begins to speak more clear to you. To you. And the more you operate in the fruit of the Spirit, the more you'll see the gifts of the Spirit operate in your life. But not just mature, but two. One, we are created and saved to hear God's voice. But two, this is what it says. God calls us by name. Jesus says, I call my sheep. My sheep know me and I know them. He calls me by name. Look at yourself and say, he calls me by name. He calls you by name. You're not saved in some bulk price that God bought you from. He saved you individually. He calls us by name and he calls us up into our identity and calls us out of our lives. These shepherds in, in this scripture, literally they put all these different flocks together in this one sheepfold. So how would you identify your sheep from everybody else's sheep? They didn't brand sheep. They didn't tag sheep. So how would they identify their sheep? How would they get their sheep separated again? And literally every single shepherd had a unique call for their sheep. Every shepherd had a unique call. Some may use a little tiny flute. Some may be, use a whistle. Some may use a different term. But they could identify the voice of their shepherd. And it was so distinct, they actually tried, even today, to take different shepherds, put them in, their shep in the real shepherd's clothes, and a stranger go up to their sheep and call them with that sh same call, and the sheep will run away from the stranger. That's how distinct this call is. So when God says he calls you by name, when he calls you, it sounds different than every other voice. 
When he calls you out, it sounds different than every other voice. See, when God calls you out, he'll call you up first. Got to call you up into your identity. Got to call you up. And then he'll call you out of something. The enemy just calls you out. The enemy will just call you out. He never calls you up. See, the enemy calls you out because he wants you to sit in your shame. He wants you to sit in your guilt. He wants you to sit in your failures. He wants you to sit in your fears. He wants you to sit in your anxiety. So he'll call it out. He'll call out your fears. He'll call out your, your failures. He'll call out your shame. He'll call out your sin. He'll call it all out. God will do the same thing. Before God gets to the what, he gets to the why. With Adam and Eve, when, he, when they sin, they're running away, they're hiding. He didn't say, what have you done, Adam? What have you done, Eve? He said, where are you? He was trying to call them up before he addressed the out. Gideon in Judges chapter 6, one of my favorite chapters in the Bible. Gideon is sitting in a wine press making bread because the Midianites would come in and steal everything they had, so he's hiding, hoping to get this last piece of bread. And Jesus shows up. Jesus shows up to Gideon at his lowest point of his life, the lowest point of his soul, the moment of anxiety and depression. Literally, he's going to eat this piece of bread and die. And Jesus shows up. He doesn't say, Gideon, what are you doing? Why are you being such a girl, being a sissy? we got a war to fight. What are you doing? He didn't address him that way. He shows up. He says, Gideon, you mighty, valiant warrior of God. He called him up into a new identity. He didn't say, Gideon, what are you doing? You're a failure. I wanted to use you, but look, I can't use this. God doesn't speak like that. God says, Peter, on this rock, I'll build my church. Then he corrected him. Gideon, you are a mighty man of God. Then he corrects him. God calls us up. Then he calls us out. And he calls us by name. Zacchaeus hanging up in a tree. Jesus walking through Jericho. Zacchaeus, the sinner of sinners, the tax collector, the thief, the robber. He's up in the tree. Jesus walks by and says, Zacchaeus, you filthy sinner, what are you doing? Zacchaeus, I'm going to have dinner with you today. God calls you up before he calls you out. And so when you start hearing being called out, called out, called out, called out, called out, you let the wrong voice into your life. When you keep getting called out of your sin but never called up, see, Jesus calls us out of our sin and up into him. He says, I'm the way. I'm the truth. I'm the life. You cannot do it. Call me up, and then I'll call you out. See, he calls us up into our identity, but then he calls us out of the lies we've been believing, the lies about who we are, the lies about what we've done, the lies that there is no future or no hope for us. See, God is a God who speaks to call us up so he can call us out. See, some of you in this room, you're in the wrong sheepfold. You're in the wrong pasture. You're in the wrong location. You're in the wrong purpose. You're in the wrong identity. You're in the wrong destiny. But you can't get called out because you've got your ears closed to what God is saying. But as soon as you take off those earmuffs and you allow God's voice to speak, he'll call you up into his child, into being his people. So he can call you out of there into the place he's purposed for you to be. And the last point, God leads us by his voice. And he leads us from wandering defeat upon victory, upon victory, upon victory. But he leads us there through his voice. And until you get in tune with his voice, you'll keep wandering and wandering and wandering. Until you start to hear his voice, you'll keep wandering in defeat upon defeat upon defeat, from pattern to pattern, from abuse to abuse, from bad relationship to bad relationship. But once you hear his voice, he'll begin to lead you into greener pastures. Psalms 23, he leads me beside still waters. How does he lead me? I can't see him, so i got to hear him. I can't see where he's leading me. I have to listen to where he's leading me. When he starts leading me, he leads me to victory. He says this in Isaiah 30. He says, and your ears shall hear a word behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. And when you turn to the right or when you turn to the left, then you will defile your carved idols overlaid with silver and your gold-plated metal images. You will scatter them as unclean things. You will say to them, be gone. He calls them up. It says, no, no, this is the way. This is the way, walk in it. 
But then as you look to the left and you see all your junk, you look to the right and you see all your pain, you see all your shame, you'll look and you say, no, no, that's not me anymore. Be gone. See, until you can clearly hear the voice of the Lord, you'll keep going left and you'll keep going right when God is trying to lead you straight. And it comes from the voice of the Lord. It is his nature to speak to you. It is in your nature. You are created and saved to hear his voice. It's his nature. It's your nature. And when you come together, that's when you start living out the blessed life Jesus has for you. Now, how does he speak? We'll unpack that next week. How does God speak to me? And I believe for every single person, there's a different way God speaks to us. Then how can I hear him more clearly? There's ways that you can begin to discern God's voice in your life. And then four, we'll unpack what is the gift of prophecy? How can I take what God has given me and how can I share it with somebody who needs the encouragement from God? It's that simple. So if you would stand to your feet, please, all of all the room. I want you to just bow your heads and close your eyes just, just for a second. We've got a couple of minutes. I'm just going to ask one question. If you're in this room today and you said, you know what? I do believe we're led by the voices we listen to. And I've been listening to the wrong voices and I need an encouragement from the Lord this morning. I need God to speak into my life. I need him to call me by name. I need him to lead me away from the left and the right and to make my way straight. That you, you said, I just need an encouragement from the Lord this morning. That you, every head is bowed, every eye is closed, just for a second. He said, that's me. I just want you to slip your hand up right where you are. Thank you. Anybody else? All in the room. We're going to do something different. If you, if you raise your hand, if I am Marissa and, and Pastor Brian and Toy, if you, if you raise your hand, can you just come down? I want to pray for you. I also want to speak some things over your life. So if you raise your hand, Everybody else, if you just begin to pray, Dylan, if you can play a little bit more. If you say, you know what, I just need encouragement. And I just want you guys down here just to pray. If you have a word, release that word. Just begin to pray over them and speak over them. If I can get any of the, uh, the prayer team, come forward too to help. 